Hi, this is Akil coming to you from Chicago with The Shelley Story. Uh, my wife Shelley and I wrote a book and are currently working on a movie about our journeys with mental health, uh, specifically bipolar disorder. As an offshoot of that, we've developed a podcast called The Shelley Story, where we speak to people from a broad variety of backgrounds about diverse issues, uh, most notably mental health. Uh, one of the methodologies that's been used in a broad variety of contexts, uh, notably in corporate settings, uh, is a Myers-Briggs type indicator or MBTI. I actually came across it uh, in business school in a leadership development program and really found it fascinating as a way to identify strengths, weaknesses, compatibilities, uh, and other nuggets to help uh, guide my work. Uh, so I'm really excited to speak to today's guest, Joe Arrigo, uh, an expert on all things MBTI. Uh, Joe and I had connected on LinkedIn through some shared connections, and I really found his content on this framework fascinating. I was just overjoyed uh, that he agreed to be on the podcast. Uh, so I'll go ahead and tell you a little bit about Joe. Joe Arrigo is a typology addict, pontificator, and Myers-Briggs type indicator certified coach. He's an INTJ. Uh, topics of discussion that get him going are philosophy, economics, politics, Bitcoin, books, music, and personality type. He's a lifelong learner discovering that his truest passion is reading. In 2020, his goal is to read 100 books by the end of the year, and he wound up reading uh, 105. Uh, when he's not buried in a book, Joe can be found finishing a puzzle with his wife, uh, working out, uh, eating carnivore, and using the MBTI assessment uh, to engage with the world around him. Uh, recently, he's completed his first short book on MBTI and will be releasing it this summer. Uh, so, Joe, again, it's great to have you uh, have you on the show. If there's anything you want to add to uh, to what I had uh, what I had shared with the audience just here. No, I, I really appreciate the concise intro. It's funny to be called an expert. And I feel like, gosh, I've, I really like, I guess that's, I would never call myself that, but people say like, well, Joe's an expert. So I guess I'll allow it. <laughs> that is, is essentially me. I, I do feel like my truest passion is is reading, but also uh, my, the Myers-Briggs type indicator, as, as you mentioned. And um, I do not see myself changing my career ever. Like this is where I'm supposed to be. Just in a nutshell, I guess, you know, because we talk about, obviously, we got on the screen here that you're a recruiter, uh, but I wanted to get a better understanding of your path uh, to MBTI uh, in the context of uh, recruiting and coaching and, and all that good stuff. So if you could yeah. sort of paint us the picture of how you uh, how you got to this point. Yeah, and I appreciate you asking me that because I'm really usually bad at, um, gosh, talking about myself. I always think I always think my journey is boring. Uh, when I got out of film school, I did what every film major does. They go into sales because right. film doesn't pay. Um, and uh, then I, I w did sales roles, cold call, uh, call center stuff, landed in recruiting. And recruiting was one of those first areas where you start to really understand like what a culture fit means and what like yeah. placing placing the right candidate in a company by their personality type. They didn't call it that. They said culture fit. But I sure. think that's where you know your, pers they your personality isn't good or it is good. So when I got furloughed due to COVID, it was one of those opportunities where life kind of gives you just that smallest amount of like, hey, here's an opening. You're never going to have another chance in your life where you're getting paid by the government to sit around. You're still getting commission checks and yeah. we're going to subsidize you to start your business. So I started it. You fast forward about two and a half years till now and I'm still going strong. Um, I landed a contract recruiting role during um, uh, COVID in the last couple of months. So been fortunate there, but I do I do think MBTI and recruiting can go together, and that's part of what my book's actually about is like how corporations can integrate type into the recruiting and interviewing process without yeah. having biases or any uh, discrimination issues using it. I, I think it would be helpful because I always found this thing fascinating. I mean, the first time I heard about it, like I said, I I did it in a leadership development uh, program, but. Uh, this might be a challenge, but I'm wondering, can you, in a nutshell, maybe talk about what the MBTI is for maybe people who aren't as familiar with it? It is a self-assessment that groups you into a, a huge box of uh, 16 types. And basically what the assessment will give you is a four letter code comprised of eight different letters, um, extroversion versus introversion, that's E versus I, intuition versus sensation, that's um, N versus S, thinking versus feeling, that's your T and F, and then judging versus perceiving, that's your J and P. And essentially what you can do a lot of things with this, you mentioned the corporate environment. So many books have been written on, there's a book called Do What You Are, which is an MBTI career, you know, what career should I do as a ENFJ? And yeah. um, it's kind of like a, what, what color is your parachute with, uh, with type 
type indicator there? <laughs> Essentially, yeah. Like the colors is like a temperament based one. And, and really, actually, I'm glad you mentioned that because when you look at the intro for co like w the colors and stuff like that, it's all based off Carl Jung and temperament. Mm. And they're like, oh, like Jung was an influence. They all say it. So why not just go with the best and go with Carl Jung's original work with, with psychological type? Yeah. And you mentioned Carl Jung. And one of the things that's, that I found interesting was I think it's your YouTube uh, channel. It, your, your persona is the ghost of uh, ghost of Jung. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's that in my Etsy store where I, I try to make uh, posters and t-shirts based on type. But yeah, ghost of Jung really I felt like that's what I was striving towards. Mm -hmm. So like in terms of your introduction to MBTI, you mentioned that it was, you know, during COVID, it was something you uh, really went all in on. Like, was it something that was introduced to you in the recruiting context or it's something like, I'd like to understand that a little bit more, yeah. sort of what, uh, what your exposure was? Well, I think at first it was Facebook or something where someone would post their results and I, they said, hey, take, take it. And then I did. And then I kept doing that every successive year. And I kept saying, like, even in my book, I said, like, it was the third year in a row that I was taken and I got INTJ. Hmm. Um, and I, and I write that it, I didn't find type type found me and like the universe mm. was like this you know keeps keeps sending me this signal every once in a while i just had to answer it but um i did what everyone did 16 personalities that gives you the yep. <laughs> which is actually based on the big five will give you that like intj a or intj t uh, so i started there that was a catalyst oh, 16 personalities is based on the big five is yeah that you said? Oh, so that okay. that I'm last really dash t dash a is the fifth trait of neuroticism in the big five mm. so they kind of judge you if you're a t a turbulent you're a more neurotic type or a assertive you're more i guess you know balanced so that's how they get a that's how the 16 personality gets away with not like plagiarizing mbti because there is a lot of crossover there's a lot of overlap yeah. and correlation but um i did that and then i just had enough i was at a stage where i was plateauing like i wasn't life was good life was not terrible or bad but i had yeah. enough brain capacity to like dig deeper and like i went way down the rabbit hole like way whatever past the rabbit hole is that's where i was with type like ever consumed all the yeah. stuff and at some point i just said hey look i need to make this a business because it's the only thing i think about all day like every, just type was everywhere so i said i should at least do something with this you know the go, working with recruiters that's sort of from a different uh, lifetime for me. I haven't worked with a recruiter in, in quite a while. Usually when I have worked with recruiters in the past, the, they do a great job. I mean, they have relationships with the companies mm -hmm. and they'll give you the insights like, hey, we placed a candidate here and this is the path that they went down and you've got a great background. Here's what you want to play up and align it with the role. But I've never, act, I don't think I've seen any recruiter that's actually uh, incorporated this into their practice. Have, have you come across that at all? Or is this, is this pretty unique? I, I would say it's pretty unique. I have not, I know a lot of recruiters that like it. They like, oh, mm -hmm. I like they, they kind of know it, but implementing it. No, I, I think, I don't want to say I'm the first because that sounds arrogant, but I, so far yeah. I've not come across anyone that has used it deliberately. I have done it um, in my recent contract role with, job descriptions. I've added these sections for mindset. And essentially what yeah. I'm trying to do is write an inter internal dialogue for what types I believe will be good at this role. So the yeah. candidates will not say, oh, I, I'm probably that. They will self-select out. I'm absolutely not that. I will not apply in the hopes that the company will get a good candidate and the candidate won't waste their time with a long application process or an interview. And then in the interviewing you can interview using all eight of the cognitive functions because they, they provide a path for your, your cognitive pathway. So if you ask a question mm -hmm. to like, like a Nikhil asks you a question and it happened to be one of your weakest functions, I will be able to tell you're either lying to me, you're making up an answer or you literally, right. your brain doesn't do it that often. So it's not, it's not flexing something it's used to flexing. So in that mm -hmm. way you can use type without saying like, I only want INTJs, which is a, a no-no in HR. Right. Yeah, illegal, yeah, right. yes. <laughs> right, or oh, INTJs only. <laughs> yeah, and I think yeah. some people I, would do that. ES, ESTPs need not apply. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. that's what it'd be. So I'm, I'm curious, I wanna understand like, uh, cause I think when we talked, you said that you are, 
your vertical or your your um, functional area is primarily in technology. How, how does that sort of lay out then? Is it technical roles in a variety of industries or is it... Uh... When I first started in a staffing firm, I was all technical recruiting. My current contract role is more on the pharmaceutical. There are okay. some tech roles, but it's mostly in like quality control, quality assurance. Yeah. And I mean, that that's a fascinating field like you and I have talked about because typically technical work is something that requires a lot of very in-depth focused uh, work, right? And it's not mm -hmm. something, you know, obviously there's there's interaction and you have your scrum meetings and, and there is that interactive element, but, you know, a lot of times there is the need for, uh, for focus and, uh, and, and deep attention. Is it something that you give them the test when you, when you bring them through the process or is it something you sort of glean about like what their type is or get, I'm pretty much anti-test or assessment. We don't we we mm -hmm. do not say test because that implies there's wrong answers. <laughs> but we say assessment. It's just I even say test now too. But I just don't think a a self-assessment would be good in the corporate setting because I've actually had a, a recruiter friend of mine that um, administered it to like hundreds and hundreds of people over the years, and there's only four types that ever come out of it. It's always mm -hmm. ESTJ, okay. ISTJ, INTJ, ENTJ. And it's like well yeah. clearly that's that's not it. There's all these others. There's there's 12 others. So people in a corporate setting will try to guess what they want to hear. So in that sense, it's yeah. not, it's not good. If you're a skilled practitioner and you're used to trying to look at type, you can see like, oh, I'm getting this answer by the way that they phrase, they say things. They're most likely one of these two types. And I can be pretty sure they would be. Um, so from the candidate point of view, I'm not giving an assessment. I'm asking questions in a certain way that will give me a, how strong are they in this function? No, that, and that's a great point. That was one of my concerns with the, uh, the MBTI was just, it seems like you can sort of skew it to the answer that you want. Like if you're in, like I was saying before in business school, there's a lot of type A personalities and sure. they all want to be, they all want to have a C in their title. <laughs> so, yeah. so they're going to game the system. How do you introduce MBTI into the actual like the position you're sourcing. For. Oh, that's right. That's right. Like, it's because obviously it's not something where you talk to the MBTI department at uh, at at Facebook, right? No. Uh, and they give you the the exact type. Like I, I want to understand sort of how you okay. Uh, and I will give that a, on to the and then for also for the for the company so, as a whole. Understood. That's a great question. And I'll, I'll give you like a very specific example because my my biggest problem as an INTJ is that I make these intuitive leaps. Where I just I fill in all like I assume everyone will fill in the blanks. So I'm gonna do my best to just give a very practical detail yeah. by detail answer, which is that um, you have a job rec, a manager, you'll speak to the manager if you're a recruiter, and you ask them what you're looking for, like very broadly, and they'll tell you. And what they'll tell you is functionally as an MBTI practitioner, what the person needs, what mm -hmm. they need. So they might need someone that needs a little bit extroverted thinking, introverted sensing. So we're talking ISTJ, ESTJ. And what they'll tell you is they'll need someone who's extremely organized, uh, good at pr uh, prioritizing their time, um, knows how to delegate tasks, stuff like that. So now we're, we're getting a type, but they're not yeah. telling us, but that we're thinking, okay. So when I write a job description based on that, I'm adding that, that sort of mindset is like, what would an ESTJ, ISTJ, ESFJ, or ISFJ, what would mm -hmm. they think? in the seat and I'll write that dialogue down. So that's about as practical as I can get with, with how you would write it down. That's why when you see stuff that's like team player, problem solver, strategy, it's like, well, that's everyone. Everyone has a certain right. level of strategy in their mind. Right. So I results, get away from results that. oriented. That's my, that's my favorite one. It's like, why else would you be working? <laughs> you don't want a result. Yeah. And are you not, so he like a, not a team player. Yeah. <laughs> so you, we talk about the ridiculousness of job descriptions and we're not doing anything about it. We're not using a different framework. So we wouldn't say team player would be like, you know, striving for har harmonious relationships amongst team, but you could also say the opposite, which would be like um, striving to challenge every single member of my team. That is, those are different. There's like, mm -hmm. I'm challenging people or I'm harmonized, which like, I want everyone to get 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 along versus i want everyone to be competitive that's like a extroverted feeling and um extroverted thinking so enfj or an entj type yeah so i'm thinking about that 
it's a bit nuanced and it takes a lot of work, but it will get you better candidates. I, I think, man, you and I have uh, talked about this prior, but like, I honestly wouldn't even try to introduce type to a large organization like a Google or a yeah. Gym. Gym. It's just that was my next question. Is, so giant. Like, yeah. what are you going to, what a change can you affect in a company that's got like a thousand VPs? <laughs> like, what are you yeah. going to do? It's too, yeah. it, there's too many layers. You can't restructure it. You have no power. It's like, it might as well be get with a small team within the organization and work with, you know, five to 10 people, but don't try to like talk to the CEO and have them revamp it. I just, it's a waste of time. I mean, you can add zeros to your invoice, but right. are you helping people? I don't think so. Your, your business is, you know, the MBTI coach. Like, can you tell me a little bit more about sort of how that works? Because yeah. it sounds like there's two general buckets. You've got the workshops and you can go into a little bit more detail about that. But then there's a the one-on-one -on -one coaching, which it sounds like that has felt a lot more impactful, even if it might not be as lucrative. Yes. Um, but like, how does, like, let's say if I were to sign up with you and say, hey, I need an MBTI coach, like, what would, what would that look like? It would be, um, it would be five session, five one hour sessions of teaching the model um, from just like what, what the four letter code is to the PhD level class, which is understanding the archetypes and the eight, mo eight function model, which is like the one that I, I really like, um, which mm -hmm. is very complicated. And, and then the next five weeks or hours would be implementation, reiteration, adjusting, like as you go out into the world and, and try on what you've learned. My kind of tagline is from Galileo, which is like, you cannot teach a man anything. You, you can only help him reveal what's already there. So I just mm. teach the model. I don't say you need to do this as this type because you're weak here. I just say, here's the model. And every type has a unique revelation where they're like, oh, everything makes sense now. And it's great to see that moment as a coach where like that light switch goes on. And like this explains everything about why I shouldn't be in this career or why I definitely need to keep pursuing this career. And then uh, the workshops you mentioned, I guess, I, wa I wanted to understand, because this was something that I found very interesting, is that, you know, it, it, I like what you said about how you can just add uh, zeros to the, to the paycheck if you're, if you're going to work with um, big corporate or, you know, do, do workshops. But um, I'd like to understand <clears throat> sort of what the reception has been from uh, some of these bigger organizations uh, when you're doing these uh, workshops. Like, t take us, take me through that, because it's, it's... Yeah, I've... I've submitted a number of proposals and I've had a number of discussions with like directors of HR and things like that. And I sort of have a, not like, not, I wouldn't say jaded, but I feel like they're not, they're not effective in the sense that, that someone spending the money on it thinks it will be. And the problem sure. with that is because unless every single person that's sitting in the workshop is super a true believer, most people have been like, yeah, I got, I took that test before and it didn't, it didn't line and the practitioner wasn't good. So they're already sitting there kind of like with poopy pants, just being like, <laughs> like not participating, ruining it for everyone else. You can't help people as much. I do think, and I write this in my, my new book, which is like, if you do insist on doing a workshop, there's a couple things that will make it better. And I think most practitioners do this, but I think you need to divide people into very small groups divide the introverts and the extroverts, but then mix introverts and extroverts, talk about like what annoys you about communicating with this type. And you can, yeah. if, as long as everyone's like in a psychologically safe space, you will get something out of it, but it's that ongoing implementation and reiteration that you miss with the workshop. Yeah. Uh, it's sort of like they spent money, everyone feels better for a couple of days, but then you put your test results somewhere and you forget what your type is. And I mean, we've all been through that because I remember like 20 years ago, one of the companies I've worked with, uh, they're really big, big into the seven habits of highly effective people. And, you know, it, it was like split down the line. There are people who are, you know, complete Stephen Covey zealots and they're <laughs> big fanboys of you yeah. know, the Franklin Covey methodology. And then, yeah, there were people who just, you know, like we were talking about like Michael Scott in the office, you know, he signs his name Daffy Duck in the <laughs> diversity training, right? I want to understand like, when you found out your personality type, like what kind of impact did that have in your uh, personal journey? Was it, did it confirm a lot of the or not, or like assumptions you had about yourself or did it give you some new insights? Maybe just tell me a little bit more. Yeah, about I think you're, you're, you nailed it with saying like it confirmed some things, but it also gave me a language to speak about it to others. And sure. that's the most beautiful part about type is it is a shared language. Like when you say, 
I'm an introverted intuitive, that means something. And that, that label tells someone like, this is the thought process of this person. So when I, I started digging into type, I, I started to look at retroactively my friends group, books I like, authors I like, music I mm -hmm. like. And I go, oh, well, that, that producer's an INTJ. Christopher Nolan, one of my favorite filmmakers, he's an INTJ. Yeah. Um, mm. You know, I've read a lot of Nietzsche. I, I like Nikola Tesla, all INTJs. And I was like, wow, that's so unique how I didn't know that. But these yeah. are men, women, creators that I could now model myself after in a way. So every type will have that. They'll start to see people around them and influences on their life probably be either their, their type or their sister type. Like I have a big fascination with ENTJs as well. So like you, yeah, it's I think just you did some videos about like working with them or something. Like, yeah. Yeah. I didn't have a big Napoleon poster behind me and I've read, I've read a book on Caesar. So like, I really like them. And I think like, even if you're an ENFP, you'll resonate with the INFP, but you'll just understand that you're not alone and your thoughts have been thought before and that's okay. That's great. Mm -hmm. And, and you have a place in the world. So with your personality type, I'm just curious, like INTJ, like, is there like the, the magic MB, uh, type that you work well with? Oh I'm yeah. Good question. That's a great question. Cause that's like, that's the thing. Is it theory? And then what actually happens in the real world? Um, <laughs> right. Usually it matches pretty good. I love ENTJs. Obviously they're sister types. So their cognitive functions are just slightly flipped in a playful setting uh, with, with the opposite sex. ENFP females typically are the most like attractive or attracted to each other very yeah. complimentary because that type is very much willing to hear you out joke with you stay open-minded just play along very well i have the hardest time in the world with enfjs i don't know why mm. but <laughs> i'm just i okay. look at their functions and i go there must be something there that makes them i'm not i don't understand them they don't understand me so we typically just like grind it's like what is going on so um that would be the answer there I'm just curious, like, because my uh, my personality type is uh, ISTP. Uh, off the top, you know, pop quiz yeah. here. What, yeah. what would be the best uh, personality type for me? And then right after this, I'm going to go have my wife take the 60 personalities <laughs> quiz. Uh, no, I'll send you a better one. I'll send you a better <laughs> okay. assessment. Yeah, a free one. Yeah. Well, the way the, the the way that I look at that, like, the top of my head, is that there is a shadow type of all personalities. So, yeah, um, ISTP um, would be ESTJ would be the opposite personality type or there'd be the shadow of yourself. So right. I think you had mentioned that you had gotten ESTJ when you tested back in. Like, yeah. Yeah. So, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a little okay, bit. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, well, ahead. my best working relationships are with ENTPs, which are my shadow type. So it's interesting that I think that yin yang really actually works in theory and in practice. So ESTJ hmm. would be yours. Yeah, and that's a good segue into what I was going to talk about next <laughs> is, like I said, I had uh, taken this test back in uh, business school. And as I had as, as I had shared with you, um, our journey, Shelly, you know, my wife and I uh, really revolves around mental health, specifically bipolar disorder, uh, because it's something that I was struggling with for more than 20 years and hadn't gotten the diagnosis. And so I got the diagnosis in 2016. And you know, things are knock on wood. I mean, things are pretty good right now. I'd say a lot more stable. There's a lot less ups and downs. Life is not all roses, but obviously, you know, there's definitely it's a much brighter uh, present than, it, than the past. But I do want to say that when I took the MBTI back in, uh, I want to say it was 2010, uh, I was in business school, you know, working a full-time job. And in, in addition to that, uh, you know, I had come from a immigrant background. Like my parents were born in India, they came here and they really impressed upon me the importance of really, really hard work, uh, putting your nose to the grindstone and, and really just tuning out any distractions and any sense of depression or anxiety was seen as a weakness, it was seen <laughs> as a crutch, right? Uh, so there was a lot of dismissing a lot of that stuff and really just keeping your eyes on the prize. Uh, and so in business school, especially you know at the time, uh, I had, you know, I was going through a manic episode. There was a lot of goal oriented. They say that with, uh, with mania, there's a lot of goal oriented behavior, which, you know, hmm. it, it sounds like it'd be a good thing, but it's <laughs> a little bit pathological, right? Yeah. It's just, you're very, very like, you know, come hell or high water. Right. So when I took the test back then I got uh, ESTJ and then I wouldn't say like my personality is completely opposite. 
But at heart, I was def- I'm definitely an introvert. So now my personality type is uh, is ISTP. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was something that I found fascinating was how can you know how can a personality type uh, shift that much? So I wanted to understand from you, uh, have you seen that? Uh, have you seen that type of situation where a personality type will uh, shift that dramatically? Well, I guess I would start by saying um, it t- personality type does not change. Mm-hmm. But the caveat I will say is you provide a perfect example of someone who is, quote, living in their shadow. Right. They spent so much time in a mm-hmm. place that they're not innately supposed to be that Jung and Freud and Adler, they'd all say the same thing. They'd say, eventually it came to a head that, like where their neuro- like the neurotic tendencies, the manic episodes, the hallucinations, the nightmares, anxiety, palpitations, those are all based on you living where you should not be. Mm -hmm. And if you would have got a different type, I would be like, oh, I don't know how to explain it. But the the fact that typologically speaking, you literally got the the shadow, I have to believe that you were just in a place for so long that you just bubbled up to the surface. You suppressed it for as long as you could. Right. Um, so someone else asked me this question, and that's like the last part of my book that I'm 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 finishing, which is can person mm-hmm. personality type change? And I think it cannot. It's like the best description I've heard is that there is a personality type is like the structure of your house, foundation, walls, the architecture. Those say the same, but you can change the paint color, you can move new furniture, and you can sl- slap a new floor, paint, roof, all that, and make it look different. Or even keeping it as simple as like you know they say lipstick on a pig. Yeah. It's still a cosmetic still, change, superficial changes. Yeah. yeah. So like you getting a different job or dating a different person or moving to a different country may look like, Oh, he's, you know, he's taking a change. He's just, he's just the same person, but he might develop weaker parts of the personality. So that's what I want to say is most people say I used to be an introvert. Now I'm an extrovert. And mm-hmm. then I go, no, you used to be weak at extroversion. You're better at extroversion now as you grow up, but that doesn't mean you've met, you're now an extrovert. Yeah. Do I seem like an introvert or extrovert to you? Well, it's hard. It's hard to answer that objectively, right? Because I already know the answer. Um, but I would say probably introvert, to be honest. Right. I mean, you are you're personable, you're friendly. You know, obviously online, you like to joke around and stuff. But yeah, I can see that you're probably get more energy, like you know, sort of being more introspective. I guess. Sure. And and I think um, even my my own dad is like, no, you're an extrovert because he he only okay. sees me like interacting with him about like sports or whatever. So it's like, yeah, that doesn't mean I'm now an extrovert because I'm, I've done more speeches and I I've gotten more comfortable being a public speaker. My core personality is still introvert. So you maybe had to take on extroverted tendencies for 20 years, you say. So like yeah. no one would have probably said Nikhil's an introvert. No, I mean, because, um, you know, uh, when I was in high school and college, you know, I was really into theater uh, I, cool. I love doing impressions. I'm like at the party, I'm the guy who's like, Hey, do that, do that personality. <laughs> maybe, maybe when we stop recording, I'll do my Shrek impersonation. Since oh, that's who I got. I, uh, <laughs> yes. <ISTP. laughs> um, and that was one of the other things I wanted to, to, to talk about and get your take is America has always been a very individualistic society. The, the, the pursuit of happiness is literally written in our uh, declaration of mm-hmm. independence. Right? Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's something that in order to realize that American dream, there is that need to really go, go all out or go all in or however you want to look right. at it. And when you, when you think about a pioneer, when you think about a trailblazer, you never think about a bookworm. You never think about that guy who's, you know, got his nose in a book <laughs> in the library. Um, so there was always, I would say, a bias towards extroversion, not just in my culture being, you know, part of that immigrant ethos. But in the United States, definitely there was a premium placed on people who are magnetic and who can mm. who can draw crowds in. I mean, I, I'd say I, I can I can get by, but you know, if if you put me in a room with a bunch of people, I mean, I my first tendency is not to go up to everyone and shake hands. I'm just you know I kind of want to I don't want to get a feel for the room. Right. Um, like, do you in in your research and your understanding? I mean, do you think there's been more of an embracing of uh, people with the uh, introvert, in, introverted oh, yeah. uh, personality type? Do you think there's more appreciation for it? Yes, totally. And you make a great point. Uh, Susan Cain brought this up in her book, Quiet. Yeah, Quiet. Yep. It yep. was a hard book for me to read. It was so dense. But 
one thing that stuck in my head was like, we kind of got all sucked into the Dale Carnegie, how to win friends and influence people type sales mentality, where it's like the more magnetic yep. and gregarious you were, the more you would succeed. And I think for a long time you, you did. Like yeah. it'd be hard to argue that introverts made more money or, you know, were better politicians with Zoom being with, with like e-commerce, being able to make, to do a business with, out, without being like a door-to-door -door salesperson or right. you know, introverts have kind of like become, they have come like to the forefront of like business. I mean, you have people like Gates, but I think you have people like Elon Musk being an INTJ. That's kind of like the weird quirky introverted tendencies that even though he's out in the world, very visible, yeah. you can tell he's an, like an awkward kind of person and he doesn't do great yeah. when he does speeches. So I think we're on an even scale now of like who can succeed and who can't. And I think introverts are, are doing like, I think we have a lot of good representation. Yeah. And I mean, I, I came across some great posts on media, you know, in defense of introverts or, yeah. you know, the, the rise of the introverts. And I think that's important because you can't have a, an organization that's, um, I, I think, uh, one of the, one of the best ways to phrase it was I'll, I'll take Bill Gates over Steve Ballmer any day. Right. Oh because yeah. It's like you think about whenever you think of Steve Ballmer, I don't know if you've seen that clip of oh, him yeah. running around on stage, all sweaty. And, yes. then, and then if you look at the returns, you know, Microsoft under an, an extrovert was, that was like their worst stock performance in history. Right. Versus, I don't know what Satya Nadella's, uh, MBTI is, but you know, the, the point is, I mean, I, it's, it's reassuring. And I feel good about this when I talk to my kids because, you know, they're, they're personable, but they're not like the social butterflies that, you know, our, my parents told me I had to be. And I'm like, that's completely fine. You know, I mean, if, if you want to stay at home and uh, play uh, animal crossing on a, on a Friday night, nothing wrong with that. You yeah. know, that's not going to prevent you from having a, a happy, uh, happy, healthy life. Right. And that's a great, that's a great, parenting message i mean my wife and i just had a son and he's like five weeks old and then like i know given like the um she's an MBTI type does he have an mbti type <laughs> not yet he can't quite self-assess but he's getting there and right. as soon as he can right. i will try to type him but my wife's an ICJ. I'm an INTJ. The likelihood if you do like a punnett square or whatever it's called mm -hmm. he'll probably be an introvert um, based on like, and based on lineage and genetics of like, I have more introverts in my family. So the message is, is great. Is like, it's okay to be, you don't have to go out on Friday night because like the society says like, Oh, you're being a wet blanket, dude. Like what's wrong? Like none of that. That's not going to happen. I think that's less and less happening in society. With MBTI, there's been, I think it's a, it's a very well-known personality test, but as with anything, I mean, something that's that pervasive, there's going to be uh, the share of skeptics and critics. Um, there was a, a video I saw uh, by Jordan Peterson where I think he talks about he's more in favor of the big five because he said the, I think it was like MBTI, it's favored because you can't get it wrong or something like that. No one's feelings get hurt. No one's feelings that that's, that's, that's it. Yeah. And then uh, other critics had said most of the time you take it five weeks later and it's completely wrong. What, what do you say to the uh, MBTI doubting Thomases out there? I don't try to argue uh, uh, statistics like reliability or validity. I don't try to like beat them and say, actually, no, yeah. it's like, it, you know, Jordan Peterson. You're not, fighting, you're not fighting them on Reddit or anything. Like I'm that. not fighting them on Reddit. I'm not trying to like have an, an, an a logic based argument about facts and data because it, no one's going to be convinced. What I, what I do say is like, look, Jordan Peterson's, he, I think he's done a disservice because he's either purposely, he knows young, he's talked about young extensively. So it's like, he mm -hmm. can't pretend he doesn't know. But he, he is promoting MBTI as something that's predicting performance. And he says this all the time. And he says, well, big five will tell you who you are, but MBTI won't help predict performance where MBTI has never tried to. And Isabel Myers, when she yeah. created it, she never said it will predict performance or intelligence or your status in life. Exactly. He does a straw man where he says, type does this, but it doesn't, it's not supposed to. I'm like, well, no one's ever said it does. So one, he gets, gets it wrong there. Type was based on Jungian presuppositions and we didn't have factor analysis back then. So we couldn't really like account for, you know, is this really measuring introversion or not? And big five does better on there. That I'm like, never try to argue that. I kind of like to troll the people. I say, do you know anybody who has posted their big five results anywhere? 
there have there have been meta studies where they show like what parts of Big Five and MBTI overlap, and introversion, extroversion definitely do. They both overlap. But that's as much as I'll say because I don't really know how to articulate the statistical analysis. But there is overlap, so they're not mutually exclusive. They can work together. But it's not about whether one's more valid or not. I don't think astrology is valid, but I think a lot of people gain a lot of insight from it. And they do yeah. feel like this tells me a lot about why I act certain ways in certain times of the year and in certain sure. moon cycles. And I say, well, if that works for you and it's a tool you can utilize, then I don't need to see a, a validity study. Right. And they always miss that point. Yeah. And I'm just like, Jordan, like, why do you argue this point? And I think there's a little bit of um, financial, he has his own assessment. Adam Grant's another big guy who always hit that article from Vox that pops up every time you type in yeah. MTI has been the video where they, where they yeah. debunk it. You're talking yeah. about the, yeah. why the yeah. MTI is useless. It has like 6 million, 10 million views. I'm like, I always get sent yeah. that. I'm like, I don't care. And the other thing is when you attack Carl Jung for being racist because he was from born in 1800, like that's also unfair because he's a different, different time like what are you supposed to do yeah. do we do we invalidate him because he might have had some views about women that we don't have now yeah and that's where it's like it becomes a disingenuous argument and i'm just like we can't be we can't do that well you mentioned culture that's that's one thing that i found interesting because in that box i know what the video you're talking yeah. about or maybe it was it was somebody else uh he made actually a good point it, is that it seems like MBTI is more skewed towards the Western culture because I saw that guy, in other yeah. cultures, you know, the like I said before, America is a lot more individualistic. And so uh, there is more uh, self-awareness. There's more self-insight. I think you have more knowledge of who you are because, you know, you're spending more time on your own versus like my relatives in India, you know, they all live. They, it's a very, it's a more collectivist communal mm -hmm. uh, type of society. Uh, would you say that's that's a fair statement too? To say that maybe there's certain cultures that MBTI is more applicable to than than others, or would you say that's it's more a, universal? I, I I know this video. Um, <laughs> I actually reshared it to my community uh, on YouTube, but I think that the Isabel Myers like created it after World War II. Because mm, she's like, okay. we need to come together. We need to find out. Like, we should not have any of this this war. Basically, I'm very, I'm very simply talking about it. But the goal was that it would, it would transcend race, age, color, creed, language. These thoughts are not Western thoughts. The questions are not Western-based questions. It's, it, they're not asking like, right. when you go to a bar in New York City, like, well, let's, we don't have that experience. They're just right. asking questions that any human. Well, no. So I don't think it does. And I, and I, I remember the argument said that, that might be true. He might be right. Is it just a Western viewpoint? But like, I don't think he answered like, what else it would be yeah. like any, like, let's take Enneagram, for example, Enneagram's like ancient, but I, I, it, they've, there's never been a criticism that it's like, oh, it's, it's, you know, we can't use it in in Western world because it's comes from like Sufi like spirituality i don't know mysticism mysticism yeah, yeah. i've never heard that argument yeah I, I mean that that's the way i look at it i mean i look at this more in shades of gray and it's just sure. another piece of insight that can help you gain self-awareness it's not something that and, and and i have some issues sometimes too with it because sure. with you know my personality type is istp and there, there's definitely a lot that is pretty spot on but the one thing that i find interesting and there is actually another video that was speaking to this is that when you hear istp you think uh virtuoso or tinkerer or artist mechanic, say, like, mechanic. it's always a mechanic yeah. and i'm like the least handy guy around you know okay um so so it's interesting because um they when you hear that you're like wait a minute i'm you know i i i'm like a total butterfinger i'm not handy at all um but uh but again yeah i mean that's the way i look at it is just at it's just another data point and absolutely you know, Dario Nardi is one like one of I consider one of my mentors he's he is um he wrote a book called the neuroscience of personality and recently he's kind of come out with his neuroscience of personality 2.0 data um he wrote the first book in 2011 but mm -hmm. essentially he's come he's come back with there are four subtypes of all the types so they're like there's a there's an ENFP there's your classic like cheerleader type hype man enthusiastic but then there's also more of a dominant and there's more of a creative there's more of a harmonizing and there's a normalizing so 
the mm -hmm. brain patterns that each of the types represent are similar, but it gives them a different flavor or nuance because most ISTPs are very quiet. They answer questions with like one word, they, terse. Yeah, the terse. Terse. and, mm -hmm. but one of my favorite uh, typologists, she's an ISTP and she's a super eloquent. She talks a lot. She almost comes across as extrovert. She does like to go out in nature and like shoot guns and stuff, but mm -hmm. it's more about being an introverted thinker. Right. Like, because the way that you're asking the questions of me is like, you've asked a high level question and then you've continued to dig deeper, deeper, deeper until you understand the core essence, which is TI, introverted thinking. Mm -hmm. So when you say I'm an ISTP, I'm like, well, yeah, that makes sense because of the way that you start digging all the way down farther and farther, more niche, more nuanced. That sounds more like an ISTP than a mechanic, but yeah. okay. But that's just because yeah. we have to assign archetypes, another Jungian for thing, archetypes. And right. that just comes up more often. So I would say you're probably more of a creative ISTP than a normal, like hands-on, right. likes to work on cars or jet engines or something. Very interested. I, I read some excerpts from your book. Uh, could you tell? Could you tell me a little bit more about the book? And before you say that, uh, you definitely uh, you had me at Harold and Kumar. I will say I saw the excerpt about. Uh, uh, that scene in that movie, and then and I was like, yeah, you know, I think uh, if anything, I want to I want to read more because he's drawing those kinds of references. <laughs> That's right up my alley. But tell tell us tell us more a little about your book. Well, the book was just something that I made myself do because I hate writing, and hmm. um, okay. it's one of those challenges that I've like, every year I kind of do a challenge. One year, like you know, it was books. I got I'm gonna read a hundred mm -hmm. books, no matter hell or high water. Great phrase. Yeah. It's a very yeah. I N T J T E phrase. So, and people kept saying, you should write a book. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to fulfill their desire and mine and try to just do it and just mm. uh, just push, just make it happen. So that was part of it. But then I kind of wanted to give like my manifesto. It's, it's called, the mm. book is called Marble and Sculptor, a typed manifesto. So it's my pitch on type, my origin story. I talk about, I define the cognitive functions from my point of view. I talk about corporations, how they should use it, how they mm. do use it, how we could use it ourselves. I talk about all the resources, the books that inspired me, the YouTubers that I admire. And I just write and write. I'm trying to get 200 pages on it. But yeah, the the the, the references in my book are stupid. There's like I reference no, Con Constantine oh. from Keanu Reeves, and I reference Harold and Kumar. Kumar, and I think that's that scene when I saw it was like the funniest scene ever because it's like that made so much sense. But then suddenly I made that con that reference to how it makes sense that. Once you've gone a little bit into type, there's yeah. no way you can unsee it. And that back. scene just clicked in my head like I have to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's one of my one of my favorite movies. So I, uh, so you're definitely good. you're definitely speaking my language. It doesn't matter what your type is; it matters what you do about it. Like INTJs, oh, they tend to be like the most intellectual. But if you don't make an impact, either on like your community, your family, the business world, with that the magic of your type. Then, then what's the point of being the type if you're not going to do something about it? Yeah, you know, type does put you in a box, but it's a yeah. huge box and it will take your entire life. Jung called that individuation and it takes your entire life to do it. So your box is something that will take you forever to explore. So it's okay to be put in, in a box. So I'm going to put your information up here. So this is, uh, people are looking to get a hold of you. Mm -hmm. You're at Advisor Enterprises. Yes. Uh, it's interesting. I thought at first Avis rent a car and, and, and enterprise car had merged or something. I was like, Oh wait, no, no. Uh, <laughs> advisor enterprises.com. Yes. Uh, so that's, that's advisor, yeah. uh, SR enterprises.com, uh, Joe dash recruiter.com. And then you're on LinkedIn. LinkedIn uh, yeah. just look you up at, uh, yeah. Joe I would say LinkedIn's the easiest way I respond to, all DMs except sales pitches. Like if someone wants to say like, hey, great article or hey, Joe, you're an idiot, like Big Five's better, I will respond in kind to everybody. I just want to say, first of all, I want to say thank you to you. I, I When you reached out to me for this episode, I didn't realize how long ago we had spoken. We had a pretty interesting conversation on type. Yeah. And um, what you're doing on your, on your podcast is very interesting. Some of the guests that you've had, it's like, you know, I know that the mental health angle is there, but some of the stuff you're talking about is less boilerplate. You have a guest that are like, wow, that's an interesting, like some of the astrology and I think you have Ur Ur Urveda. Urveda that was, yeah. It's such just yeah. cool stuff and like unique. So I appreciate what you're doing um, in the mental health space and just being different 
And that's yeah, why I thought this would be like I accepted this um, enthusiastically. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, and 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 it, I'm glad you brought that up because I had actually alluded to MBTI uh, in one of the episodes. Uh, it was about the one about Ayurveda because there is uh, in in Ayurveda there's the notion of, of doshas, uh, which is the different energy types. There's Vata, Pitta, Kapha, and I, I encourage you to take a look at that a little bit more because there's a lot of parallels with MBTI. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if you've come across this a lot where people have said, have, have people brought up like, hey, is there similarities between MBTI and astrology? Like your, you know, zodiac signs mm-hmm. could be like types. Have you, has that, has that come across? Uh, have you come across oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> most commonly I see type and Enneagram layered on top of each other, but I have definitely seen recently when I posted about astrology, because I, I, I actually got a natal chart and I hired an astrologer to do a session with me and, uh, there are a lot of similarities. Like I'm a Scorpio, INTJ, Enneagram 5, which is probably like the most stereotypical of all those. So I fit in that category. So 100% mm-hmm. you can link them. Yeah, I'm an ISTP and Libra, I guess. Okay. Yeah. What's your Enneagram? I have no One? idea. I, okay. I, uh, I, I didn't know what Enneagram was until like five minutes before the show. I didn't get a chance to look it up. Okay. Uh, but I will. I will. Okay. Um, I would say you're a any uh, any particular people you're looking to uh, connect with or uh, or get a hold of? Um, if people that are in a career transition typically get a hold of me, it seems to be like it doesn't. I didn't think that would be what I would do, but it seems to me people go. I'm in this career change. I might as well see if I'm going to go on the right path, or if I'm on the right path, or if I need to change it. And they tend to go like, well, let's dig into myself. Like, let's get real introspective for a minute. And that's where they find me. And then we figure out like what we should do about your personality type. Because like, really what it is, is um, when you get into MBTI, it's really you're answering the question, what am I supposed to do about the way that I am? <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Well, Joe, thanks so much. It was a real, real pleasure to, to speak to you. You have so much amazing insight and knowledge into this really fascinating methodology and, and, and way of uh, analyzing people. So I, I really do appreciate it. I think it's going to resonate with a lot of people. So thank you. My pleasure. Thanks to kill. Yeah.